Hello, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Mr. Pardo, do you recall the first iteration of Horizon being rolled out to branches? Broadly, yes. At the time, did you have any awareness of there being bugs, errors, or defects, or acceptance incidents during the rollout? I did not know. Did you become aware of such issues occurring during that rollout at any point later in your career? Yes. Can you remember when? Unfortunately not, no. There is a sentence which you use in a number of places in your statement about your awareness of bugs, errors or defects in the Horizon system. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 111 of Mr. Pardo's statement? It's page 37. This is the first time that you use the sentence, and you do so in the context of commenting on the Josephine Hamilton case. Could it be enlarged, please? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Is that large enough, or should we zoom no, in? No, that's fine, thank you. And so in the context of Josephine Hamilton's case, you say this, Clearly the prosecution was wholly wrong, as was the continual post office refutes that the system was not at fault. Had I been aware that there was knowledge of bugs, errors and defects that could ultimately and significantly affect the cash values required to perform an acceptable balance, and I was expected to remain mute around these and continue any form of role within the security function, then I would have considered my position untenable. There are a number of parts to that sentence. First, what do you mean by bugs, errors and defects that could ultimately and significantly affect the cash values required to perform an acceptable balance? So I think there are, I refer to the, the concept of systematic week in, week out, week in, week out, bugs, er errors or defects impacting the same branch with the result that every single week losses were being generated by that branch either because the bug, error or defect was artificially reducing the payments line or artificially increasing the receipts line and then I go on to say I'd have considered the position, my position to be untenable if I was expected to say Look, Ms. Pardo, David, we've discovered this, but let's all just keep it quiet. We know what's going on. Let's just keep quiet about it. Just focusing first on, on what you were aware of, were you aware of bugs, errors or defects which could cause discrepancies in accounts? I think that th there was an awareness that this was increasingly being cited but I was still relying on the refutes that were being given back to me from the business. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 0014593? This is an email chain with recipients from post office legal services on both the civil and criminal sides and a number of people from the security team. The legal contingent included Mandy Talbot and Rob Wilson. The security team contingent included David Posnett, Tony Atting and yourself. The top email here is dated the 30th of September 2004 and is from Mandy Talbot. You are, as you can see on the copy list, 
Her email addresses a number of points arising from the proposed changes to post office accounting practices, and in particular the proposed introduction of the branch trading statement. So we can see the subject trading statement. Is it likely that you were included on the copy list because of the policy and standards role that you held reporting to Tony Utting? Potentially that would be the case, yes. Looking, please, to the seventh paragraph in this email. Scrolling down a bit, please. It starts, if Paul is going to... It says, if Paul is going to rely on data produced by the Horizon system in court, then it will need to put in place a standardised witness statement signed by a party who can confirm that the system was working accurately during particular periods of time and that the information supplied by the same is reliable. Post Office Limited and Horizon will have to identify named individuals who are prepared to undertake this task and, if necessary, who are pre prepared to attend court. Do you recall this suggestion from Mandy Talbot? Not specifically from that document, unfortunately, no. Do you remember it at all, whether in this document or elsewhere, the suggestion that if Paul were going to rely on data produced by the system, then someone would have to produce a statement that the system was working accurately and the information supplied was reliable. I recall that theme, yes, but as I say, unfortunately not from this specific document. Did you understand, either from what Mandy Talbot was saying here, or from anything said by others, that there may be occasions on which the Horizon system was not working accurately, and the information supplied was not reliable? I don't interpret that, no. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 001728088? This is an email from Mark Dinsdale, dated the 12th of March 2010 attaching something called a security, if we can scroll down, please, security four-weekly report. And you are one of a long list of recipients. What role did Mark Dinsdale hold at this time? I can only be triggered by the salutation that he was the security programme manager. What was the security four-weekly report? <coughs> and who did it go to? I think it was a stakeholder-focused report around key activities performed by the security team for that period. Can we have on screen, please, the report itself, which is document reference POL 00112809? The date of the report is the same as the email, the 12th of March 2010. Going please to page three of this report. There is a heading here, security programs for products. And under this, the fifth bullet point please, refers to Horizon Online. And it says this, due to live service issues, the decision has been made not to migrate any further branches until these issues are fully understood, necessary actions agreed, and success criteria met. In effect, the pilot stabilization period has been brought forward in order to assure the quality before proceeding. This will allow Fujitsu some time to resolve issues, including a higher than expected number of screen freezes and resultant recovery transactions. Did that cause you any concern at all when you read it? 
Not that I can recollect, no. What did you understand at the time, if you can recall, by the reference to screen freezes and resultant recovery transactions? I don't recall, sorry. Did you understand from this or from any other discussions that there were technical problems with the rollout of Horizon Online? I suspect I would have done, yes. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 001-65450? This is an email dated the 4th of June, 2014. And if we scroll down a bit, please, we can see that there is a title, update service systems down or offline. And there is an incident title there. Um, just scrolling back up, please. There's a long list of recipients again, including you. Was this an email sent to the grapevine function, given the date it is being sent? It seems to be sent to a number of the security function and to other key stakeholders in the business as well, from what I can read through. This is one of a number of documents which appear in this format. Is this a standard format email which was sent when there was a service or systems problem? I don't recall that specifically. Scrolling down, please. The incident title here reads as follows. Issues with transfer uh, acknowledgement in the national lottery system. This is causing duplicate tickets. The current business impact says this all Camelot branches will not be able to balance as they have duplicate transactions. And under case summary, scrolling down please. We have this, update 3rd of June, CGI. Do you know who CGI were? I don't, sorry, no. CGI are process of raising Fix 86 to negate the duplicate Camelot data within Credence. This should be corrected once the overnight batch jobs have processed. Update earlier that day below. Poll are currently looking at providing branches with transaction corrections. We are in the process of raising Fix 86 to negate the duplicate Camelot data within Credence. <coughs> On its face, this seems to be reporting a systems issue, meaning that Camelot branches would not be able to balance. Is that your understanding? Of it, it does, yes. Do you recall receiving this email or any like it? Not now? at all, no. Since you are on the, on the copy list for this... Do you think there was anything about this that might have concerned you on reading it at the time? With hindsight, yes, but I, I don't recall um, that feeling at the time, no. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 001 65493? This is an email dated the 10th of July, 2014. And scrolling down, please. The title, the subject, is Service Systems Performance Degraded, Reference Data Integrity Not Proven Error in Horizon. Again, it is sent to a long list of recipients, including you. So scrolling up, please.
Does that appear to you to be the same varied makeup of stakeholders within the business? It does. Under incident summary, it says this. Incident title, reference data integrity, not proven error in horizon. Next to current business impact, this under incident summary. Fujitsu have confirmed that currently 658 post office branches are affected. This number is currently increasing. Next to the case summary here, we see an update, probably makes more sense to start at the bottom. Initial 10th of July, 2014, 7.42, Fujitsu have been engaged to investigate. Next update to be sent at 10 o'clock. Fujitsu have logged the incident with BT. Fujitsu believe this to be a BTWAN failure and are currently trying to correlate information in relation to the PO branch locations to identify the geographical nature of the incident. And then above, update at 8.47, ATOS incident management have agreed to raise this incident to a P1. Can, again, can you recall receiving this email now? Not at all, no. What did you understand, or what do you understand the problem to be in this instance? I, I, even reading it now live, I'm, I'm absolutely I'm not sure what to make of that. Do you have any idea why the author of this alert chose to use the words not proven error in horizon? Not at all. Could we have on screen, please, POL 0016581? This is a case closure report dated the, the 9th of October 2014 from Robert Daly. It is sent to Denise Reed, Brian Trotter and John Breeden, copied to you among others. Can you help with why you were being copied into this case closure report, given what you have told us about your role by this point in 2014? I suspect that would be custom and practice. I, I, I look through that, I can see the majority, if not all, of the senior lead team for security being copied into that. The names are recognised there in Rob King, Sally Smith, John Bigley. Um, I assume it's just a, an email cascade. We can see that this case relates to a case set up on the 3rd of December 2012 relating to a branch named Gorbals. The inquiry type is cash loss. The primary stakeholder is Denise Reed. The identified criminal loss, scrolling down a bit please, is £34,179.54. pence. And scrolling down, please, to final outcome. And that's the in highlight there at the top of that page. PF has decided not to proceed. Can you help with PF? What does that stand for? Procurator Fistel, I suspect. Then under procedural and organisational failings... We see yes is recorded. Under this date, under this, a date is given on which procedural and organisational failings are said to have been discussed with the primary stakeholder on the 29th of January 2013. And then under any other comments, a little further down, please, it says Angus Crawford. PF has cited issues with Horizon for not proceeding with case. Do you recall receiving this case closure report? I don't know. No, I don't recall that. It appears from it that a case was being dropped because of issues with Horizon. Is that right? Absolutely. 
Can you help with what those issues were at all? Not at all, no. The form of words you use in your statement that you were unaware of bugs, errors and defects that could ultimately and significantly affect the cash values required to perform an acceptable balance. Does this reflect that you were aware of bugs, errors and defects which might affect a branch's ability to balance, but you assumed that where such problems arose, they were either fixed or did not create balancing issues which were significant? I think, yes, that they were, they were fixed or did not create those systematic balance variances. When do you think you first became aware that systems problems could arise which could cause balancing problems for branches? Again, I, w I wouldn't be able to state that with any great certainty, unfortunately. Was it before you started making prosecution decisions? No. Was it before you ceased in that role? I don't recall that. Having the awareness that you did, when sub-postmasters being criminally investigated and prosecuted, attributed apparent shortfalls to the Horizon system. Why did you dismiss these claims out of hand? I think that was following on from the repeated business assertions that Horizon was fit, robust. The inquiry has heard evidence that Fujitsu were able to access the systems in a branch remotely and alter the data. Were you aware of that? No. Had you been aware, would this have concerned you? I'd have expected that the sufficient safeguards would have been in place to maintain the probity of the system. I wouldn't have felt technically competent to be able to challenge that per se. The inquiry has also heard evidence that there were occasions on which the post office did not tell Horizon users who had been identified as affected by a bug error or defect that they had been so affected. Were you aware of this? Not at all, no, no. Had you been aware, would this have concerned you? Absolutely. As far as you are aware, did the post office ever consider that there might be discrepancies which had been caused by an issue with the system of which the user was unaware and the relevance this might have had to an investigation or prosecution? No. It's right, isn't it, that at the point of advising on whether the prosecution test was met, the criminal law team would have been reliant on investigators to provide them with all relevant material in the case? It was, yes, yes. They would be reliant on your investigators pursuing all reasonable lines of inquiry? Correct. The same is true at the point of disclosure, should a prosecution be brought, isn't it? Because... It if reasonable lines of inquiry are not pursued, then there is a risk relevant material will not have been obtained. It is. When you were an investigator, were you conscious that there was an obligation on you to pursue lines of inquiry which pointed away from, as well as towards, the guilt of the suspect? Correct, yes. When you led the fraud strand or operational security, security operations function, were you satisfied that your investigators understood their obligation to pursue lines of inquiry which pointed away from, as well as towards the guilt of the suspect? I was at the time. 
How did you satisfy yourself that that was the case? I think there was um, a blanket belief that some of the explanations being given, as astounding as it sounds, were not relevant to the case. When you were an investigator, were you aware that there was a duty on you as an investigator to obtain and consider third party material from, for example, financial institutions and Fujitsu in appropriate cases? Uh, as an investigator, not from Fujitsu, uh, that would not have been applicable, but certainly we'd seek with authority information from financial institutions. So you're saying investigators would not, not have sought material from Fujitsu? So, apologies, I thought you said when I was an investigator. Ah, when you were an investigator, I see. When you led the fraud strand and security operations function, were you satisfied that your investigators understood there was a duty to obtain and consider third party material in at an the, appropriate case? At the time, yes. How did you satisfy yourself that that was the case, that your investigators understood that obligation relating to third party disclosure or material? Again, I'd have expected that to have been covered through formal training. I'd have expected that to have been reiterated by team leaders. And I would have expected that to be directed as well by the criminal law team if they could see there was a particular absence or omission within a set of case papers. In terms of disclosure, it's right, isn't it, that the investigator in the case was normally also the disclosure officer? Almost without exception, yes. Do you recall the three R's which apply to disclosure? Retain, record, reveal? I do. What were the processes within the post office to ensure that these fundamental disclosure principles, retain, record, reveal, were applied to information held by the post office? I think across the piece, with hindsight, that was seen as an administrative case preparation function as opposed to forming a pivotal component of the criminal investigation. What processes existed within the post office security team to ensure that there was collation of information held by the post office going to the operation of Horizon? Again, I think that would come back to the, the fact that the relevance of the information was simply just not considered. What processes existed within the post office security team to ensure that there was proper recording of information held by the post office going to the operation of Horizon? Can you just repeat the question, please? what processes existed within the post office security team to ensure that there was proper recording as opposed to collation of information, recording of information held by the post office going to the operation of Horizon? I'm not aware of that, sorry. Does it follow that you can't help with whether there were any processes in the post office security team to ensure that there was proper recording of information going to the operation of Horizon, which had been raised in prior prosecutions? I can't. Yes, that's correct. Which part of the post office was the repository for information or evidence about bugs, errors and defects in Horizon? It would have sat with one of the IT functions, I can't be more specific than that, unfortunately. There would have been functions that would have faced into uh, Fujitsu. I can't be more specific. Were investigators informed or kept updated about significant changes to Horizon or about any problems, bugs, errors or defects that the post office was aware of? I suspect from documentation that's been produced as part of the inquiry that that was not always the case. 
Was there, as far as you were aware, any formal coherent approach across prosecutions as to what the investigative approach should be when a sub-postmaster sought to rely on Horizon as explaining losses which formed the basis of a no, prosecution? No, there wasn't. Turning, please, to the witness evidence which was provided by Fujitsu in support of prosecutions brought by the post office. In terms of the people who you recall from Fujitsu who provided prosecution support, is it right that you recall Penny Thomas being involved in ARQ requests? I do. And these requests being provided by the return of password-protected CD-ROMs? I do. Could we have paragraph 84 of Mr. Pardo's statement on screen, please? That's page 31. Towards the bottom of the page at 84. You say, in terms of additional prosecution support, then I obviously recall that Fujitsu would provide expert witness testimony presented by Gareth Jenkins. I'm unsure what the contractual basis for this was. Your recollection of the involvement of Penny Thomas and Gareth Jenkins, does that come from your time as a senior security manager heading up the fraud or security op operations strand? Or does that come from your time when you headed up the grapevine function? I think Penny Thomas resonates more from heading up the grapevine function. I think that Gareth Jenkins will resonate from both grapevine function and from the fraud strong function as well. When you were in security operations and making decisions on prosecutions, did you understand that the prosecution had specific responsibilities when they instructed an expert? to ensure that the expert was properly instructed to provide an opinion or questions on issues between the parties? Not specifically, and I would have relied heavily on the criminal law team to ensure that those duties were fulfilled. And the same question in relation to whether you were aware that such instructions should be confirmed by way of a written document. I'm not aware of that. And that the expert understood what the expert's duties to the court entailed. I would make an assumption that that was the case. Did you know that the instruction of an expert gave rise to distinct disclosure obligations on the part of the prosecution including that the prosecutor was required to bring to the attention of the defence and to the court any material which the prosecutor was aware of being reasonably capable of undermining the expert's opinion? I was not advised of that, of, of that no. Were you aware that there was a particular duty to retain communications between the police and experts, such as forensic scientists, reports of work carried out by experts, and schedules of scientific material prepared by the expert for the investigator for the purposes of criminal proceedings. Appertaining to that particular case or to a theme of cases, sorry? So in the context of the provision of expert evidence, um, specifically by Fujitsu, were you aware that there was a duty on prosecutors, a disclosure duty, to retain communications between the investigator and the expert? Yes, I would have been. Were you aware that there was a duty to record the existence of such communications on a disclosure schedule? Yes, I would have been. You address your role in relation to Grapevine at paragraph 82 of your statement. Could we have that on screen, please? It's page 31. Here you say this. 
There was a period towards the end of my career when I managed the crime intelligence function under the heading Grapevine. This function acted as the conduit between the operational investigators and Fujitsu in terms of ARQ requests. This was a stringent process and covered by a policy that unfortunately hasn't been presented to me within supplied documents. I didn't act as the gatekeeper to requests. I do recall that Dave Posnett would get involved in out-of-course requests in terms of size. <coughs> Turning, please, to paragraph 99 over the page. Apologies, it's not over the page. Page 34, please. At 99, you say, other than acting in a role that had team members who acted as the conduit between post office investigation, investigators and Fujitsu, then I can't recall any regular contact with them. Contact histori historically was via the information security team. Can you recall the casework management team having a role as being the point of contact between investigators and Fujitsu? Yes, they will be. And was that casework management function something which came to be part of the grapevine function? There was a, there was a period when that was the case, yes. You say you cannot recall regular contact with Fujitsu, but your team had a role in liaising with Fujitsu over the production of witness evidence. Did you know when you headed up the grapevine function that there were certain things which were necessary inclusions in an expert report. For example, a statement setting out the substance of all instructions received. I did not know. The materials provided and considered and the document statements, evidence, information or assumptions which are material to the opinions expressed. I did not know. A statement to the effect that the expert had, has complied with his or her duty to the court to provide independent assistance by way of objective, unbiased opinion in relation to matters within their expertise. No. And an acknowledgement that the expert will inform all parties and where appropriate the court in the event that his or her opinion changes on any material issues. Again, no. It is your evidence that you did not know the contractual basis for Mr. Jenkins' involvement in cases and you had no regular contact with Fujitsu. Does it follow that although you were aware that Mr. Jenkins would provide expert witness testimony, you had no involvement in the instruction of Mr. Jenkins in any case? Absolutely, I had no involvement in his instruction whatsoever. Did you yourself check whether Mr. Jenkins had been properly instructed according to the principles relating to expert witnesses that we've just been through? No, I'd have made that assumption that that check had been conducted end-to-end -end by members of the criminal law team. Is the same true in respect of whether you yourself checked whether Mr. Jenkins understood the expert duties as were required? Correct, the same would be true. And again, in relation to whether Mr Jenkins' witness statements had the necessary inclusions for expert evidence. And again, the same would be true. Turning, please, to some of the specific case studies with which you had involvement. Is it right that in relation to all of the inquiry criminal prosecution case studies you comment on in your statement, that is the cases of Josephine Hamilton, Susan Rudkin, Julian Wilson, Peter Holmes, Seema Misra, Alison Hall, Lynette Hutchings, Grant Allen, Kaya Mishak, Angela Sefton and Anne Neal, Neald, you now consider that the prosecution was wholly wrong as was the continual post office position that the system was not at fault. I would have more confidence in making that assertion if I'd have been approached prior to this with examples of the bugs, errors and defects 
that had actually applied to those cases that you've just accounted to me. In the absence of those, then yes, I, I must make the assertion that those prosecutions were wholly wrong. Well, the, the question is based on a summary of the same paragraph that you've included and that word in. It is. In relation to each and every one of those case studies. It is. Does that remain your position that you consider that the prosecution was wholly wrong? Prosecution was wholly wrong. If I may just go on, there should have been more care and attention in supporting the impact of some postmasters to uncover the root cause. I do not propose to take you through the papers relating to all of these cases, but in relation to some cases, you appear to have had greater involvement in the progression of the case. Um, and in particular, I'd like to deal please with the case of Josephine Hamilton. You note in your statement that this is a case where the prosecution was authorized by Tony Utting who is listed on the suspect offender report as the designated prosecution authority. So this wasn't a case which you authorised prosecution in, but you did become involved, you say in your statement, at a later stage, specifically when consideration was being given to whether pleas to false accounting charges should be accepted. Is that right? That's right. This is a case where the charges brought were of both theft and false accounting. It is a case in relation to which you say you were aware of the allegations being made by Mrs. Hamilton around Horizon IT issues, is that right? It is. You say in your statement that you would have read the suspect offender report produced by Graham Brander in this case. Would this have been when you became involved in consideration of plea or before that? I think the former in consideration of plea. You've had a chance to reread Mr. Brander's report for the purposes of preparing your statement for the inquiry, is that right? It is. Could we have the report on screen, please? It is POL 000. Four seven nine five five. We see here, as you note, Tony Utting is listed as the designated prosecution authority. Going to page five of this document, please. Scrolling down, please. We see here the author is the investigator in the case, Graham Brander and the report is dated the 17th of May, 2006. Just pausing there, did Graham Brander report to you? He would have been, from memory, a direct report to a direct report, so he would have reported via a team leader into myself. Going, please, to page three of this document. At the top, Mr Brander says this, Having analysed the Horizon printouts and accounting documentation, I was unable to find any evidence of theft or that the cash figures had been deliberately inflated. This was a case in which the prosecution was for theft as well as false accounting. Did it concern you when you read this report that a prosecution for theft had been brought by the post office in a case where the investigator in the case was unable to find any evidence of theft? From memory, that was, I don't think this case is isolated in that approach. I think that there was quite a common practice by the criminal law team. And what was that practice? That there would be a charge of theft and then also <coughs> charges of false accounting. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 0004908.3. Starting, please, with the email about halfway down this page. This is an email from Jennifer Andrews from the criminal law team to the SD 
Prosecution Office, dated the 9th of October 2007. Can you help with what the SD Prosecution Office's role was? No, I can't. No, no. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that term. This email is copied to Graham Brander, Colin Price, and Juliet McFarlane. As we can see from the subject of the email, it relates to the case against Josephine Hamilton. Ms. Andrews is forwarding an email from counsel for the post office in the case, Richard Jewelry. So scrolling down, please, to the next page. We see there Richard Jewelry. And his email <coughs> reads as follows. Juliet, Juliet, Janae, counsel defending has offered pleas to false accounting in this matter. I presume counts two to nine inclusive and asked me to take instructions as to whether this might be an appropriate offer. My view is that there is evidence she has taken the money and that there is sufficient evidence to support theft, but Royal Mail may be content with guilty pleas to dishonesty matters if she undertook to repay the amount of the shortage at audit, i.e. £36,444.89. It might be worth speaking to the officers, Graham Brander and Colin Price, to canvas their views. Scrolling up, please, to the top of the page, the first page. We see an email from Graham Brander to Jennifer Andrews and Juliet McFarlane, dated the 10th of October 2007. This email is copied to you, among others. Mr. Brander says this in his email. Janae, Juliet, I agree with counsel. In my opinion, the evidence clearly shows theft, charge one. However, if the defence are offering up guilty pleas to all false, false accounting charges, 2 to 15, on my copy of indictment, then I would suggest we accept this on the understanding that Mrs Hamilton agrees to repay the full amount. Any decision in respect of whether we accept this would need to be made by Dave Pardo. Should we take it from this that, at least in this case, the decision on acceptance of a plea needed to come from you? Yes. Was that always the case, that the senior security manager needed to agree any plea agreement? No, absolutely not. Many of these decisions would have been made uh, quite dynamically on the day. So that they would be made um, in, in court on the day without any reference to myself and rather with reference to the um, criminal law team. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 3049154? This is a memo dated the 15th of November 2007 from Juliet McFarlane. If we scroll down, please, at the bottom there, to the investigation team. Going back up, please. Copied to... Graham Brander, Jed Harbinson, and you. It reads as follows. I refer to previous correspondence regarding this matter. As you know, there has been some discussion as to whether or not pleas to false accounting would be acceptable. I note this would be agreeable, providing that Mrs. Hamilton were to repay the full amount. On counsel's request, this matter has been listed for mention on the 19th of November, 2007. The purpose of this is to see whether or not the trial can be vacated. It is possible that Mrs. Hamilton may wish to enter pleas to false accounting. I understand, that she, however, that she is not yet in a position to repay and has not given a date as to when this can be done. One option would be for the theft count to be left on file pending payment by the date of trial or some later date. Ms. McFarlane is essentially saying that pleas to false accounting would be agreeable, conditional, conditional upon... Mrs. Hamilton repaying the full amount of the apparent shortfall, isn't she? Absolutely. This is in circumstances where, regardless of the assessment of counsel and the investigation, investigator in the case at this point, originally in the investigator report, the investigator had found no evidence of theft or even the cash figures being deliberately inflated. Correct. 
you say in your statement at paragraph 108 that you link the ultimate agreement to drop the theft charge to the lack of theft evidence. Is that a fair summary of your paragraph? Absolutely, yes. We can see that Jed Harbinson's view was being sought, if we scroll down a little, please, on the prospects of recovery by a confiscation order should please be entered on the false accounting. Is it fair to say that the prospects of recovery of the money was a key consideration for the post office when considering what plea might be agreeable? It would have been one consideration. I wouldn't describe it as key, it, but certainly it would have been one consideration. I do recall it would have been more problematic to secure confiscation based on the false accounting piece than on a conviction for a straight theft charge, yes. At the time, did you think it was appropriate to make acceptance of pleas to false accounting dependent on Mrs Hamilton repaying the full amount of the apparent shortfall? I didn't know because that had been almost custom and practice from myself being a quite a junior investigator all the way through my uh, tenure with the post office. That had been an adopted practice. This by no means struck me as being a one-off case. So in answer to that, you think at the time you thought that it was appropriate? I didn't think any different. It, 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 it's something that I, my professional career within the security function had grown up with. You're aware now, aren't you, that the way this was dealt with, making repayment a condition of dropping the theft charge, was criticised by the Court of Appeal when it overturned Mrs Hamilton's conviction. They said that it placed undue pressure on Mrs Hamilton. You're aware of that now, aren't you? Indeed, yes. There is a memo from Juliet McFarlane, also well, dated the 19th of November 2007, which you were copied into. Can we have that on screen, please? The reference is POL 0004388. We can see that the memo goes to the investigation team, copied specifically to Graham Brander, Jed Harbinson, and you. And it reads as follows. The defendant appeared before the court today the prosecution was represented by Mr. Richard Jury of 9 to 12 Bell Yard, London, and the defendant was represented by Anita Saran. The defendant pleaded guilty to the false accounting counts 2 to 15 on the indictment. The case has been adjourned for pre-sentence reports. The defendant has been informed that full payment must be made prior to that date. The theft count has remained on the file, on file, on the understanding that it should be proceeded with if the money is not repaid. It is believed that the defendant has monies which will be available at the end of the year. If the defendant does not repay, then consideration will need to be given to the practicalities of proceeding with the charge of theft or whether confiscation proceedings should pursue. I note that the compensation outstanding is, is and there's the figure. I note that the figure canvassed, the higher sum is a sum which includes interest. The greatest sum will no doubt be pursued should confiscation proceedings be brought. And then this at the penultimate paragraph. It has been made clear to the defence that there must be some recognition that the defendant had the money short of theft and that a plea on the basis that the loss was due to the computer not working properly will not be accepted. You were aware that Mrs Hamilton had raised allegations that the Horizon system was not working properly. And this memo is making clear the post office position that a plea on the basis the loss was due to the computer not working properly would not be accepted. We've seen reference in the email of the 10th of October from Mr Brander to the decision on plea ultimately being a matter for you. Was this a stipulation which came from you or not? Absolutely not. Was it a stipulation with which you agreed?
I'm not sure I thought that at the time, whether he agreed or disagreed with it. It was a, it was a stipulation. I'm fairly sure it wasn't in isolation just towards this case. I think it was part of the whole um, horizon defence piece that was being practised across the post office at the time. Was this an example of a post office line to take, that the computer not working properly was not to be entertained as a defence to a criminal allegation? I think that's fair to say, yes. You say in your statement at paragraph 138 that you can say that dropping the theft charge in relation to acceptance of falsification of accounts was certainly not unheard of. Is that um, the same point that you've already made? It, it, it is, is indeed, part yes. And parcel it, of a wider picture. It is indeed, and it, and it certainly wasn't a recent thing, it, you know. As I said, even from being a junior investigator, it would be a custom and practice. Was this practice to bring charges for theft as well as false accounting intended to put pressure on a defendant to plead guilty to a lesser plea, to a lesser charge, forgive me? I could only make that assumption that that's the case, yes. The concluding paragraphs in your statement are set out um, at uh, 180 to 181. Um, could we have that on screen, please? This is page 54 of the statement. You said, paragraph 180, the more I see and hear from the inquiry, then the further I despair. It strikes me that no one at a suitable level of seniority had the conviction and gumption to say enough is enough and to drive a timely, truly independent review while ceasing all prosecution activity and having the courage to be prepared to support the application and lessons of a truly independent horizon review to both historic prosecutions and non-prosecuted repayment of accounting shortfalls. As someone with set, that held several investigatory roles in the post office, I feel utterly deceived. You go on to say, with hindsight, there should have been a team of skilled analysts working on behalf of branch errors, conducting full error analysis, using complete and unabridged Fujitsu data, including all reversals. This level of transparency would have supported SPMRs to come forward at low-level loss stage rather than being pushed into sy systematic false accounting series. You've made fairly plain your position in relation to the post office stance relating to the Horizon system. Looking back, do you think that you bore any responsibility for the perpetuation of the post office stance in relation to Horizon? I was part of that group thinking it would be remiss of me to sit here today and say that I didn't. Looking back, do you think you bore any responsibility for what happened to the individuals who were affected? I think in the absence of a more complete ability to conduct investigations into those conditions, then yes. Sir, those are all the questions that I have for Mr. Pardo. There are some questions from core participants. All right. Who's going first? Uh, Mr. Jacob, sir. I can. You can, good. Um, thank you. So um, I'm going to be asking you about Peter Holmes. Um, and um, Marion Holmes, his widow, sits next to me 
today. Um, you deal with the prosecution of Peter Holmes at paragraphs 130 to 134 of your statement. And um, in Mr. Holmes's case, the Court of Appeal found that um, his prosecution had been an abusive process. There was no evidence to corroborate the Horizon evidence. There was no investigation into the integrity of the Horizon figures. And there was no proof of any actual loss to the post office. Were you aware of that? Or are, or, or are you now aware of that? I'm now aware of that, but I'm only aware through my involvement today in the inquiry. Yes. And um, you say at paragraph 30, 131 of your evidence that you were the nominated representative in the case. For prosecution purposes, yes. Yes. And is that the same as the designated prosecution authority? Because I think that's how your name appears it in is. some of the documents. It is. And just um, um, for completeness, um, you say at paragraph 56 of your evidence that um, the job of the designated prosecution authority or nominated representative was to confirm the CLT decision, um, check the decision for fairness and objectivity, and place the case on, into prosecution status. Is that right? Correct. So you're effectively authorising a decision that's already been made? Correct. Would you describe it as a rubber stamping exercise in any way? I think I've already referred to it in, in, okay. in that manner. Thank you. The position I adopted, apologies for talking over you, is that uh, I would not have felt professionally equipped to counter a decision that's been made by a, a senior or principal lawyer in the matter. Well, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at paragraph 132 of your statement, in relation to Mr. Holmes's case, you say, I can see that horizon difficulties have been cited. Again, these assertions would have been transacted with the fact that a steady stream of denials were being issued by a post office. So your position is that it was the post office um, repeated assertions, as you've said, that was factoring into these prosecution decisions. Is that right? Absolutely. And um, you make... Um, a statement at um, paragraph 134 in relation to Mr. Holmes's case, which is similar to the statement, in fact, is worded the same as what you say in relation to others. And you say the prosecution was wholly wrong, which, of course, the Court of Appeal have found, um, and, you, um, and you say, had I been aware that there was knowledge of bugs, errors, and defects, and you go on to say that could ultimately... Um, affect significant, significantly cash values, require to perform an acceptable balance, and you were expected to remain mute around these and continue in your security function, you would have considered your position untenable. Now, the, the, the inquiry has had evidence that there was knowledge of bugs, errors and defects within post office and Fujitsu, uh, certainly at the time of Mr Holmes's prosecution. That's something that you're aware of, isn't it? I'm not, I'm not aware of it at that time. Right. No, at the time you weren't aware of it, but, but have you become aware Sorry, of that no. now through Ab following the inquiry? Absolutely. And we understand then that your evidence is that information of the knowledge of bugs, errors and defects the post office had was withheld from you. Is that right? I can only assume that, yes. And is it then, it must follow from that, that had this information, and Mr Holmes had repeatedly in his interview um, blamed and criticised the Horizon system, had this information not been withheld from you, it must follow that you would not have authorised Mr Holmes' prosecution? Correct. Well, thank you for that. Um, and... Um, uh, if I could then ask you to turn to paragraph 78 of your witness statement. Now, that's page 29 of 62, and um, the reference is WIT N0817010. You should have that on the screen in a minute, unless I've given the wrong number, of course. Here it is, 78. So if we could perhaps um, scroll... Down And you can say, um, you, you, you say here, I recall with an element of clarity updates from John Scott assuring the security function that the system was reliable and we were able to continue with BAU activity. I'm assuming that's business as usual. It is. 
Um, so, in relation to the clarity of your recollection, what can you tell um, the inquiry about the detail of these updates, their dates, their frequency? I, I couldn't go into that level of granularity. Apologies. OK, but um, when you say with clarity, um, are you able to say the wording, what was being said, how often, who, who it was addressed to? I'm, uh, unfortunately not, no. no. Okay. There, there was a persistent sentiment that the system was fit for purpose. Mm. I was never in a meeting when it was discussed with me the concept of putting the brakes on prosecution activity. Mm. It's clear that there was a fear that to do that would immediately cast out on prosecutions that had been completed that had gone before. I was never privy to that type of conversation, no. But I think we can see from your statement that this was coming from John Scott. It was coming from John Scott. The one I remember probably with greater clarity is the Paul of Vanell's Well, I was going to ask you about that, yes, if you could carry uh, on. And I'm sure that that preceded known media interest that was imminently about to go public. And I'm, I'm sure there was some form of written communication to say, you know, look, folks, this is likely to be out within the public domain. Um, and the approach we're taking is this, 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 and this, to paraphrase. And would that have been before the Computer Weekly article in 2009, perhaps? Could have been round about the same right time. Then. But it was a clear communication. And who was it addressed to from? I think, I think, it, I think it went to everybody. It wasn't security, family whole, specific. I'm sure it went to everybody. So the whole organisation was told there's going to be something in the media about Horizon and it is to be disregarded because everything's robust. And I certainly recall a reading a written rebuttal and position that the business were adopting. Yeah. You... Um, you said in your evidence at around about 11.45 this morning when you were taken to Mr Jarnail Singh's email um, after the Seema Misra um, trial, you said that, that, that horizon bashing sentiment was being used at every level. And um, how frequently were you hearing this and who, who, what sort of people and what sort of roles were responsible? I just... Re recollect it being a consistent organisational fee that there was uh, nothing wrong with Horizon. It was simply a hook that individuals were attaching themselves to to try and explain um, unexplained losses that were being incurred at branch. It was almost the modern theme rather than place blame on employees it, it was, you know, almost more palatable just to play, place blame on the Horizon system. It was, just a, it was just a whole sentiment at the time. And does this arise from what the Chief Executive Officer had been saying and what John Scott had said? It, 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 was, it was all... Everything that was building up to that form of sentiment. Right. Yes. Um, now, you were taken um, a moment ago by Ms Price to what you say at the end of your statement at paragraphs 180 and 181... Um, and what you end with in, relation, in paragraph 180 is you say, as someone that held several investigatory roles in the post office, I feel utterly deceived. Now, as the person who authorised Mr Holmes' prosecution, do you have anything to say to Mrs Holmes and to other sub-postmasters about that deception? Absolutely. I was omitted from, I believe, from key information that would help me to direct investigation resource and support individuals. Do you have anything you wish to say to Mrs Holmes herself? I wonder if any words I could express would, would help to resolve what happened. I really do. Thank I you. Gen genuinely do. As I said, uh, you know, I go back to my time at district days when we were supported and encouraged to support on a one-to-one -one basis some postmasters and the business fast forwards 10, 20 years and rather improve that level of support, 
it appears to have just stepped backwards from it. Thank you. I haven't any further questions. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Henry, please. Uh, Mr. Pardo, I represent a number of sub postmasters whose lives were destroyed by the Horizon IT scandal. Um, you would agree, as a general principle, that you cannot put a price on justice. I would. And that in the discharge of the post office's duty as a private prosecutor, um, money ought to have been no object in ensuring that it fulfilled and complied with its obligations. I would. Yeah. And so you were aware, uh, maybe not the section of the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act, but you were aware that material which might reasonably be considered capable of undermining the case for the prosecution against an accused or of assisting the case for the accused ought to be disclosed. I think there was a view being taken around the relevance of that and that it simply, as astounding as it sounds to sit here today, that it simply was not relevant. Well, that is a decision which is either so irrational or it is taken in bad faith. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? I think the issue of disclosure, there was a focus on that, on the administrative discharge, as opposed to it being a fundamental part of a proper and correct investigation. So in other words, lip service, administrative tick box, saying one thing but meaning or doing another, as opposed to a profound uh, adherence to the principle of disclosure. From all levels, yes. Right. Were you aware that in conducting an investigation, an investigator should pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry, whether they pointed towards or away from a suspect? Of course, yes. You were. So you agree with me that it ought not to be about money. It, it ought to be, this is a very important obligation which rests on our shoulders and we should discharge it to the best of our ability, whatever the cost. You agree with that in principle? I do. Uh, and that matters that pointed away from the suspect ought to have a high value so far as the investigation is concerned. Were considered relevant, I do, yes. Yes. Now, I want to ask you, please, and we're just going to concentrate on one document, and it's POL 00064033, and it's a financial investigation policy log uh, compiled by a man called uh, Mick Matthews, whom I think you recall. I do. You do. Well, I wonder if that could be put up on screen so that you can uh, see it. And we just go through it briefly. This is what Mr. Matthews says. He, he's commenced an investigation into Miss Janet Louise Skinner, ex-sub-postmaster of North Bransom Post Office. She's under investigation for the suspected theft of nearly £60,000 while she was employed as a sub-postmaster. This investigation is for the purpose of identifying money laundering offences and confiscation. The investigation will be proportionate, have a legal framework, accountable and necessary. And then it says it will follow the legal requirements of the Proceeds of Crime Act, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, Criminal Procedures and Investigations Act, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. It will also be European Convention on Human Rights compliant, etc., etc. And what I want to put to you, sir, is that the prosecution is not what it says, or the post office is not what it says, but what it does. It's got to be judged on its actions. Do you agree with that? I do. You do. Um, on the 7th of 
December 2006, Diane Matthews, who recently gave evidence, reported that Wendy Lyle, the replacement uh, sub-postmaster at North Bransom, had been suspended on suspicion of theft and that Diane Matthews was to establish the details. So it followed that Miss Skinner um, was accused of uh, the suspected theft of nearly 60,000 pounds. And at the time, she was uh, in negotiations to settle this by way of a plea to false accounting. You may not have been aware of that. No. Right. Um, but let me, let me just briefly ask you to um, consider this. Miss Skinner had been ringing up the help desk time and time again, complaining about the system. And then, lo and behold, her replacement is then, a few weeks after that, suspended on suspicion of theft. Um, those two facts were capable, were they not, of suggesting that the system was at fault not the individual. Do you agree? I don't understand the full context of the case, but that's a potential, yes. That's a potential. Now, that was as long ago as uh, December 06. Um, on the 22nd of May, Mr. Matthews spoke to a person called Juliet, uh, as it occurred to him that the defence would say that Miss Skinner has not benefited from crime as it was a member of staff. Sorry, could you scroll down? I do apologise. I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling my screen, but uh, unfortunately, um, yours, yours is, is not. Um, what, I, what I want to uh, go to is that on the um, 22nd of May 2007, and this is page two of three, uh, Mr Matthew says, it occurred to me that I had not made any inquiries about Wendy, and he describes her there as Liddell, in fact, it's Lyle. I looked through the event log and read the entry date, the 7th of December. I had overlooked pursuing the matter, decided to find out what the current position was, received an email from Dave Pardo, my new line manager, to the effect that no further resources were to be expended on the case in respect of Wendy Lyle. Do you recall contacting Mr. Matthews, and telling him not to pursue his inquiries into Wendy Lyle? Absolutely not. 27th of August, it occurred to me that in the interests of justice, we could be rightfully criticised for not carrying out a comprehensive investigation into Wendy Lyle. I spoke with and asked him, that's you, Mr. Pardo, to reconsider allocating resources in order for the matter to be further investigated. And you are reported to have said, Mr. Pardo, that if we are criticised, so be it. No further investigation resource was going to be allocated. Do you recall saying that to Mr. Matthews? I don't recall that position, and it, it wouldn't be something that I'd adopt within my leadership style. It's not a question of costs, as you rightly said at the out outset, because costs shouldn't have anything to do with the discharge of justice. Were you aware, Mr. Pardo, of the problems with the system and that this might reveal with stark clarity the problems in the system? Not at all. Further, 27th of August, following the conversation, it occurred to me that the defense in the interests of justice may well be entitled to a comprehensive investigation, and it is my view that one should be carried out. Spoke with Dave again, and he said he did not agree, and he was maintaining his position. Mr. Pardo, do you recall that conversation? Absolutely not. It's been put there fairly and squarely in this report by Mr. Matthews. Uh, how would this report be circulated, sir? It's obviously got a purpose, hasn't it? Well, it, it's a log of proceeds of crime type activity, of pocket right. activity. Right. 
Following the conversation, it occurred to me that the defence in the interests of justice may well be entitled to a comprehensive investigation. He was spelling that out to you, wasn't he? Until this was presented to me by as part of the inquiry bundles, I had no knowledge of this document. No, but it's not a question of you having knowledge of this document. I'm now asking you to recall on your oath or affirmation what was said on the 27th of August 2007 when Mr Matthews was saying that in the interests of justice the defence may well be entitled to a comprehensive investigation and that one should be carried out. Are you saying you do not recall that? From 16 years ago, absolutely. Do you think that this is a demonstration of the groupthink, of the siege mentality in action, the I'd very need... thing? Sorry, I apologise. I'd need to understand the context of that. I really would. You would? I would. You would agree? No, I said I'd need to understand the full context. I, I do not recognise... We all have a, a certain leadership style. I do not recognise my leadership style within that. I do not see what I would have to gain from reducing activity in that area by one of my, at the time, um, financial investigators. I don't understand the context of that w whatsoever. For me, it seems such a, a, a cursory thing that I, I would just authorise further investigations as required. There was nothing to be gained by me in saying that, you know, under no circumstances should resource be applied to that. There would simply be nothing to be gained. Well, isn't this actually a way for you to acknowledge what you have, by implication, accused others of, which is the groupthink, which is we have to protect, this is the theme, we have to protect Horizon at all costs. Not at all. Because there it is, it's simple, unambiguous language. It occurs to Mr Matthews that in the interests of justice, the defence may well be entitled to a comprehensive investigation and that one should be carried out. And you contradict him, state you do not agree, and maintaining your position that you are not going to fund that inquiry. Allegedly contradict him. I, 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 nothing is served by repetition, but the last time, just now, asking you knowing the solemnity of this moment and knowing what happened to the people I represent, is there anything you would like to say arising from what you have read and what I have put to you in this document? I do not recall the document whatsoever. Is that it, Mr Henry? That is it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? No, sir. I think those are all the questions from core participants. Thank you. Then thank you, Mr. Pardo, for um, a comprehensive witness statement and answering a good many questions today. I'm sorry if it was inconvenient for you to start at 9 o'clock. That was because I have to go somewhere shortly. Um, those who are listening to your evidence with a personal interest in it, I hope they found it informative. So thank you all, everyone, and we will begin again at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. Thank you.